my mind right now, I'm thinking of a compound that has the following characteristics. Excess of this can cause toxic lung damage, and it can promote rapid combustion. Now, upon hearing those two facts, would you want to be near this compound? Probably not. But I'm describing oxygen, an element necessary to our very survival. Nonetheless, by telling you of only its negative effects, I am channeling your perception to see only the disadvantages. Now, I'd like you to view this photo. This building is called the Center of Innovation for Medical Education. Now, where would you expect to find a building like this? Perhaps the United States, Canada, or anywhere in Europe? With a budget of over $15 million and equipped with technology more advanced than that of the United States, this building is part of the Aga Khan University, located in Karachi, Pakistan. In the Western world, we are often under the very prescriptions that society has tempted us to obtain about the term underdevelopment, a label given to countries of economic and political instability. However, it would be inaccurate to claim that countries that have been labeled as such are void of problems. But today, I argue that we shouldn't equate the underdevelopment of a country to the underdevelopment of its people. An article by The Guardian once claimed, and I quote, we must ensure that nurturing this grotesque lack of reality, that most of the world is one block of poverty-stricken people, is not the legacy of our generation. This past summer, I had the privilege of attending a camp called Global Encounters, which took place in Pakistan. Global Encounters is an international program for Ismaili Muslim youth focused on service, leadership development, and global citizenship. Over the past six years, 720 participants from 33 countries have made lifelong friendships, contributed over 30,000 volunteer hours to local schools and communities, and transformed the way that they think about the world. During my trip, my group and I traveled from Karachi to Islamabad, the capital of the country, and concluded our trip in the northern areas, specifically Hunza and Gilgit. During our time in Karachi, 42 participants from 14 different countries participated in service learning at one of four respective service sites, which included an urban-based health clinic, a senior citizen home, and two community-based schools. But today, I'd like to specifically share with you a memorable highlight of my trip to Gilgit. This experience transformed the way in which I view women in third world countries. During one of the cultural exposure sites in Gilgit, all the students of my camp and I were divided into various activities that were prominent in the northern regions, which included embroidery, cooking, and wood carving. During our time in Karachi, however, we recognized that most of the shops and businesses we explored were predominantly run by men. However, in Gilgit, we met two women who began to tell us that while their husbands were often working in the deeper ends of the village to earn money for their families, sometimes that money wouldn't be sufficient to even feed one child. Due to this, teams of women gathered together to apply for loans and build businesses from the skills that they did have. Whether that be embroidery, wood carving, or cooking, groups of Muslim women suddenly became entrepreneurs, feeding their families on their own. Specifically focusing on women, we could also look at Samina Baig, the first Pakistani woman to peak Everest, or perhaps the two women I met, Shamim and Gulzadi, who began their own business by simply baking bread. With a 95% literacy rate in Hunza, more than any other city in Pakistan, I now view these women as not solely as business entrepreneurs, but also as global trailblazers necessary for the world to see. So why don't we ever talk about stories like this? In today's fast-paced world, information is at our fingertips and constantly surrounding us. Because 35 gigabytes of information is received by our brains every day, it is becoming increasingly easier to compartmentalize groups of people and certain environments into larger and larger boxes. 
The narrow casting that news outlets often display combined with an often blurred line between fact and opinion. Sometimes we don't recognize the complexities of others. While the media naturally magnetizes towards the negative and associates terminology such as underdeveloped, lacking, or under-resourced with countries like Pakistan, we never hear stories of success in entrepreneurship. The men and women I encountered, however, recognize that while they may not have the luxuries of the Western world and sometimes not even the basic necessities, they recognize that, but they learn to live within their environments to the best of their ability. While Pakistan has its share of problems, when we umbrella the term underdeveloped over any third world country, we are choosing, intentionally choosing, to limit that country's success to its economic and political instability. But what about art? history, culture, music, heritage, religion, the other components that bring out the best in any country and the best in its people. When we learn to recognize third world countries as multidimensional and as cosmopolitan, will we finally be able to view the potential of its people as some of great possibility as well? When we learn to recognize and understand the diversity that surrounds us every day, we are truly recognizing the ethic of inclusiveness. In today's polarized world, I argue that being accepting of diversity isn't an option, but rather it is our ultimate moral human responsibility. In a speech made by His Highness the Aga Khan during his Jodidi lecture at Harvard University, he claimed, and I quote, a pluralist cosmopolitan society is a society which not only accepts difference, but actively seeks to learn from it and understand it. In this perspective, diversity is not a burden to be endured, but an opportunity to be welcomed. A cosmopolitan society regards the distinctive threads of our particular identities as elements that bring beauty to a larger social fabric. A cosmopolitan epic accepts our ultimate moral responsibility to the whole of humanity, rather than absolutizing a presumably exceptional part. Perhaps it is a natural condition of an insecure human race to seek security in a sense of superiority. But in a world where cultures increasingly intertwine, a more generous and a more confident outlook is needed. What this means, perhaps above all else, is a readiness to participate in a true dialogue with diversity, not only in our personal relationships, but in international and institutional relationships as well. But that takes work, and it takes patience. Above all, it implies a readiness to listen, end of quote. While my trip took place globally in Pakistan, diversity shouldn't solely be expressed at the international level when we choose to recognize the essential ethics of acceptance and inclusiveness, we are displaying the highest standards of honor, respect, and compassion. So today, let us listen to each other and to the world as we collectively redevelop the term underdevelopment and upgrade not only our lives, but also the lives of others. Thank you.